Yo, 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 what's up, everybody? Thank you for tuning in to yet again another fantastic indie creator interview. It's your Cape Crusader Cody, and we are keeping it geekly with our returning guest, Richard Fairgrave. We're here to break down Octopus, a memoir of failing, and everything in between. Richard, dude, welcome back to the stream, man. Uh, how are you feeling? You just hit launch. Yeah, it, oh, look, man, you know, it's one of those, this is my first launch. Like, I was, I, I had a, another book with a publisher, and they kickstarted it last year, but like, this is me out there. Um, apparently using my hands a lot today i'm gonna put them down <laughs> here um it's sort of it's one of those mornings where you wake up and you're like what is the food that i can guarantee will not make me shit myself on a live stream oh my um, god yes <laughs> you know and so i went with i went with tuna and rice with a lot of lime and chili seasoning from trader joe's so i don't know if that was a good idea but <sighs> wish me luck breathe my man breathe i feel <laughs> it we had pizza last night i had a pizza night with the family I wanted to have a little bit of a jump in my kick since we officially were a month past drinking monsters. So I, I brewed up some coffee and uh, coffee drinkers, you know what happens when you have a long night of eating pizza and then you drink some warm coffee in the morning. Things get a little rough. Um, <laughs> we have Jay Wesley Hawker over on YouTube. Hey, Cody, you rock, buddy. Keep these interviews coming. Thank you for uh, joining us, uh, Jay Wesley. We appreciate you. Richard, I see that you're keeping it geekly as well. Uh, I think you are the first official person to wear a Keepin' It Geekly t-shirt on the other side of the microphone. So everyone else has let you down. How, how fucking <laughs> dare they? I want you to send me names of everyone you've interviewed who has ordered one of these shirts, and I will, like, Jay and Silent Bob style, travel around with my Kickstarter money and punch them. <laughs> you guys better watch out. Richard is coming to a town near you. Speaking of that, Richard... Uh, for anyone who is watching for the first time, give us a little bit about who you are. I mean, we've uh, had you on the show a couple times. I actually just recently got this, uh, and man, this is just as good to shed, uh, which was um, a campaign you ran with Lucy. Uh, so um, let's dive into that, how that went um, as well after you give us a little bit about who sure, you are. Sure. Um, so I'm Richard Fairgray. Uh, I'm the only Richard Fairgray in the world. So if you have ever heard anything about that name, it's me, and I'm sorry. Uh, I am a... <laughs> Uh, almost entirely blind comic creator from New Zealand originally, but I spent four months living with a dialect coach who made me speak in an American accent before I found out he was secretly married. It's a whole disaster. Uh, and so now I sound like this, and I live here, and I live half the time in Hollywood and half the time in Canada, and I'm a workaholic, and uh, that's probably most of it. Like, I like to think that I'm a very interesting person, and then I'm like, oh shit, I haven't left my office in four days because I've just been making comics. Yeah, I will say there was a time where, you know, I consider myself a little bit of a workaholic. And there was a time where I was literally fucking pretty concerned. Uh, you, you were like, yeah, I just passed out at my desk. I'm like, yep. bro, go sleep longer than three or four hours. No, I will, so last year, so it wasn't my fault, okay? It wasn't my fault. <laughs> I had, I had like... I was under contract for a, a, like a buttload of comics and they uh, they all kind of got delayed because of COVID and like my edit like the editorial team being fucking garbage. Um, and so stuff that was meant to be drawn in 2021 when I had a lot of fucking time. Like I made 12 extra issues of Haunted Hill back in 2021 just because I had free time to do it, right? Mm -hmm. So I had all this time to make these comics. They didn't pull their finger out of their asses to get me like notes and like even approve a synopsis for eight months. So suddenly i've signed up for a bunch of new comics in 2022 like my timeline is perfect everything is clear i'm good to go and then those old comics come back so then last year i had to draw 980 pages of full color <laughs> comics on top of like you know living my life and like looking after my husband while he was waiting for knee surgery how many so pages again 980. How, how many pages does like the average artist do a month like like one page a day Maybe two. Yeah, I think like quite often I'll talk to people and they're like, yeah, I had to pencil 20 pages this month. And I'm like, okay, so I have to pencil and ink and color and letter 20 pages a week. Or I'm like every day that someone, you know, when someone's like, hey, just take a break. I'm like, no, 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 because taking a break means that I'm more stressed later. I mean, are we sure that Richard is human at this point? We have <laughs> two geeks talking over uh, on YouTube. Richard is the original machine. Sleep is overrated for him. And John W. Part-Time Comics throwing up some horns in chat. Welcome to the stream, guys. Yeah, I think uh, you have made yourself well-known with not only your work ethic, but your work in general is just so gorgeous. Um, let's talk about Shed a little bit. So we had you on to, to kickstart Shed, um, and this was for someone else. So how was that experience for you uh, working with Lucy? Uh, well, so Lucy and I have uh, written a bunch of stuff together. We've been like 
basically best friends for years. We used to actually have a podcast called uh, In the Kitchen at the Party with the Wine, where the idea was that that's where the best conversations always have when you get away from the music and you drink wine with a stranger. And so we tried to recreate that over the phone and it was a disaster. But <laughs> I did once uh, shave half my head live on the podcast while going through a divorce and thinking it was a good idea. I also cut my own hair this morning because of stress. So I think it's just a thing I do. Wait, you should have saved that for the stream, man. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was like, I, I woke up at four and I was all antsy. And like, I, I slept in my office last night just because like, I like being around my work sometimes. Um, so I woke up before and I was all antsy. I was like, I need to have some some control over something. So I started hacking at my fucking hair. <laughs> like a maniac. Um, that is, dude, that happens, though. That happens. So, I mean, stressing out to the max. Uh, this Kickstarter, wow. man. This is your first Kickstarter. Uh, what, like, how, how are you feeling, like, leading the week leading up to it? I mean, it's it's exciting. Um, I, I actually, I flew down to Hollywood... Um, so that because I was like, look, I said to my husband, I'm going to be unbearable for the next week. You don't <laughs> want me around. I'm going to go stay at my place in Hollywood for a bit and like do all my. And also, like, I got to use the excuse of like, well, the dogs will make a lot of noise when I'm doing interviews, which is bullshit. They're very quiet dogs. Um, <laughs> but I was just like, I got to get out of here because I will be unfucking bearable. Mm -hmm. um, but no, no, Lucy and I have known each other for years. And then uh, we started writing together and. Uh, back at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, we'd like come up with this thing called Kitchen Cats, and it was about these old women who collected cat figurines that were giveaways with cookies. And like this, it became like this mafia story in a small town. And we we're like, this is garbage. And we decided to swap the cats out for my favorite fish. I'll tell that story later if you like. Uh, I think I tell it all the fucking time. You have some like, crazy stories with fishes too, man. <laughs> it's, it's, it's that same one, but I wanted to draw him into everything because he'd just been in Haunted Hill. Um, I'm actually going to put the real story of that into Haunted Hill as well. So you will get to see someone fuck the fish finally. <laughs> um, anyway, so it just changed and changed and changed. And it ended up being this like weird atmospheric horror about a small town and this like woman in her 20s who's decided to uh, like settle because she thinks she should be looking for like the happy ending to her life. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, even if it's happy, it's still an ending. And that's never something you should be seeking. Right. And uh, I didn't know what was going to happen and i thought like i think the pandemic was going to go on for like probably four or five years i'm going to be the person who doesn't do i'm not going to bake any bread i'm not going to like learn how to play an instrument i'm not going to sing on my balcony i'm going to make more comics than anybody and when we come out of this thing i'm just gonna be like boom out the gate 30 graphic novels right and uh so i started reaching out to like smaller publishers because like i don't need like the money from these ones this is my like background noise when when everyone's out of work kind of shit mm -hmm. um so i'm gonna go to small publishers and say you guys have good street cred can you get this book out there for me no one knows me in this space i'm like in the bookstore market i'm doing kids stuff all the time let me do something like that i actually care about uh and so i got i found blue fox comics they loved the pitch so we went with them and then they kickstarted it last year it actually ended up taking longer to finish because lucy got an amazing job at netflix and so she was like a lot busier wow um and because it was well she she like moved to london a month before the pandemic started and so she was like she got there she followed harry styles on tour for a little bit um went to a bunch of christmas markets got an amazing job at disney pandemic kicks in job disappears she's like doesn't have a place to live yet absolute panic feeling miserable oh, no. I'm like let's write a book because obviously like my solution to everything is let's write a book uh, and then, you know, her life got significantly better. Uh, and so, like, the book got delayed and other things. But we, we we made it. I finished it, like, beginning of last year. Put that out. And, like, I had never done Kickstarter. I mean, like, I've been in anthologies and stuff. Uh, if mm -hmm. you've read the story about the guy eating corn on the toilet uh, in Nightmare Theater, that's me. Um, uh, it's the most terrifying I could, thing I can imagine is someone taking a dump and eating corn at the same time. Because the, the butter on your hands on that toilet paper is going to be a nightmare. And well, you'll and you never use know the little corn holders. Are. There's little uh, like little prongs you put on each end. Yes, but have, like corn. Okay, okay, but have you ever eaten a cob of corn and not gotten butter all over your hands? Because if you have, you're not putting enough butter on your corn. I, 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 I like. Are you holding the the cob like this, Richard? Come on. <laughs> no, but like, like you're holding it, and then you like think of something else, so you tip it upwards, and it all just gooshes on you. <laughs> um. So anyway, so I'm the I'm the corn cob toilet guy. Um, <laughs> And um, yeah, but I'd never done a Kickstarter. So it was like very stressful, um, but like it was very stressful in that way that was totally detached from me because they took care of it. They had this inbuilt audience. And I looked at it and I was like, actually, 
this could work. I could do mm -hmm. this. And at the time I was, um, I was going through some like difficult things with, with my publisher, as I mentioned before, and it was kind of a nightmare, uh, and still is ongoing. Um, uh, but, and I'm, I probably shouldn't say things, but fuck it. I overshare. Uh, I'm still stuck drawing one more book for them. Um, but you know, it's fine. I'm going to sork in it and leave it on a big fucking cliffhanger. Um, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> Uh, they've approved the script, but I can't do shit. So I, uh, I had been like, I, I made, I made Octopus like back in 2020, like right. I'd actually made the first issue, uh, 2018, right before I started work on Black Sand Beach. And I had this one week off. So I made this issue and I didn't really know what it was going to be. It actually started out as like a one page thing. That first picture of the tentacle on the comic page talking about my life. And then I was like, I'm going to tell little stories and it's going to be weird little tableaus. And then it turned into this story of this one night and it got very like granular into what actually happened that night because it was like me making a new best friend basically um, mm -hmm. while I was in the state of turmoil. Uh, and then I just, I put it on hold for a while, did Black Sand Beach, Carbordia, did Blastosaurus, did every other fucking thing. And then at <laughs> the very beginning of the pandemic or just before it actually, like it's when, when COVID was like bubbling up and everyone was like, this is not going to be anything. And then I went to the grocery store and everything was gone. And I was like, oh, this is going to be fucking terrifying, actually, because there's no wine. No so, toilet paper either. Th no, this is before <laughs> the toilet paper disappeared. Oh. <laughs> this, is, this is, we were, it was like, uh, Ray and I, that's my husband, we were at my friend Nicole's place. Uh, we walked from my place to her place, stopped at the grocery store on the way, bought some wine. We were there for like maybe three hours. While we were at Nicole's place, it got announced that the first case had been found in the u.s and we went back to the grocery store and the whole place was empty and there was like an hour-long queue for us to get more wine and i was like this is going to be real this is going to be fucking terrifying mm -hmm. um did make the good decision to go to universal studios the next day because we knew it would be empty and it was but also it just made us very uncomfortable so we left um also we just we bought season passes like a week before oh and so that jesus was christ yeah i mean look I'm an adult. I now own my own keyboard and I can go to Universal Studios whenever I want. Like, I don't even have to win Double Dare, which is quite exciting. Um, that's a dumb joke and I'm sorry. You know, I can uh, picture you with a keytar, to be honest. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I could see you rocking it. I mean, I can play zero instruments. I actually, I, I live, <laughs> He's like, I've, Cody, I'm legally blind. Come on. <laughs> I have lived uh, in a lot of recording studios in my life. Um, and so I'm always surrounded by other people's music, but I have absolutely no musical talent whatsoever. Uh, thank God I'm okay at comics because of like my basketball career. I, I, I'm afraid of heights, but I never go tall enough for that. So anyway, back to long story longer. I, um, I start making this book. Like Ray goes back to Canada. I stay here. I'm like, let's just not travel to see each other for a little bit and just see what happens. And then of course we got stuck in separate countries for like six months. Um, and so I make this book as like this weird introspective deep dive and I show it to my agent and I show it to a couple of my friends and they're like, if you put this out, like you will get a publisher for it. That will not be a problem, but you will never work in children's books again. Uh, and at the time, like we were, there's, you know, I mean, there's like, there's a TV option on Black Sand Beach and there's interest for Carbordia and Blastosaurus is kind of this weird evergreen project because no one ever dislikes dinosaurs. Um, and I just, so I, I put it away and I didn't show it to anyone. And then like, here I am three years later, everything's still terrible in the world. We're sort mm -hmm. of doing things like normal again, but like, I'm just getting more and more frustrated with feeling like people are telling me what I can't put out into the world because, all right, let me tell you a story. Okay. Well, Here's real, real quick, real quick, real quick. Yep. We have Dr. Hino 419. Good morning, everyone over on YouTube. Thank you for stopping in Dr. Hino. Um, I just wanted to make sure we uh, address the chat real quick. So um, everyone watching real quick as well, while Richard is explaining this uh, story for us, be sure to check out the Kickstarter that we just launched literally 20 minutes ago. Um, holy shit, right now, sitting at a whopping $379, uh, 13 packers. Dude, let's fucking go. Let's go, Richard. Um, yep. That's... Ah oh, man, this is nice. This is it's, it's what's what's nice is like I do, I used to do a lot of conventions, mm -hmm. um, and you know pre COVID, and uh, you know you're there, you're selling, you're in person, you're doing the dance, you're 
doing the talk, you got your pitch. And now I'm sitting here, I'm just talking to you having a casual time and people are just buying things off to my, off to the side here. Like it's amazing. Magic. <laughs> um, hey, you're still doing the convention gig though. You still have to be entertaining on this show. That's that a big is, thing. No, I, I think, you know, I can tone it down. Well, no, 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 that's fine. I, I was going to say, uh, people have to understand that's a big part of going on to these podcasts and interviews. Like, you are selling yourself. Like, a lot of people, I think, get in that headset. Like, I'm going to go on to this podcast, and this podcast is going to get me backers. It's your actions on that podcast that translates to that. You know what I mean? Well, like, I, I always sort of feel like, I, I love coming on your show because I feel like you and I match each other's energy. Mm -hmm. And I've done shows in the past where people, like, the host will just sit there being like, uh-huh. Like, the first you time you talked about you talked about your first glory hole and they're like what <laughs> <laughs> i don't even remember my first glory hole. i remember the first time i had you on interview i'm like instantly like yep my kids cannot watch this one <laughs> <laughs> um i mean look i'm, I'm sorry I, I think your daughter liked a bunch of my facebook posts yesterday so. <laughs> well she's not old enough to have a facebook so Nice try. <laughs> okay, so someone else with the same last name as you, then maybe. Just oh, probably my name. mom. So my oh. mom is my mom is a my and, and mom. If you're watching, she probably is on Facebook. I love you to death. My biggest supporter in whatever endeavor I do. Uh, so if I'm usually sharing anything, she is right there with me. Um, much okay. love to her. Right. That's because it genuinely worried me. I was like, is Cody's daughter seeing my these garbage? poppers? <laughs> <laughs> um. So anyway, uh, here's here's what happened. Okay, so. Last year, I'm doing like a lot of promo for Haunted Hill and a lot of promo for the Send Richard a Hot Dog campaign, which obviously made me real butt sick for days. Um, and then I'm doing this, I'm doing this interview. And normally, like right before the interview, people tell me which book it's for, right? Or I check. And right before we went, uh, before I asked, right before we went live, the guy said, oh, by the way, I'm, I really love Haunted Hill. I read it and it's fantastic. And I was like, thank you so much. I guess we're talking about Haunted Hill then. So first question comes up and he says, so a lot of this, uh, a lot of the locations in your book are based on real places. What's your favorite? And I said, oh, well, Slam Town, where Eva works, is based on Slammer, the sex club over on Beverly. <laughs> and uh, their big claim to fame, it's kind of prison themed, like a lot of slings and bars and things, but there's their big claim to fame is they have the longest succatorium in Southern California. And the guy looks at me confused and I'm like, oh, that's right. Not everyone knows what a succatorium is. It's kind of like a wall of glory holes. But what really separates Slammer is that it's split level so that the guys who are getting sucked off can walk up higher and the guys who are doing the sucking can stand to do it, which is great because you don't want to be on your knees in a place like this because the floor gets pretty fucking gushy. And so I say all this and he looks at me and says, okay, but in Cardboardia, the book we're here to talk about today, there's also some real places. <laughs> I also fucked in those too. <laughs> yeah. I mean, a lot of it is set in Brooklyn, so yes. Um, but you know, it's one of it's like every time I do an interview, or when I did any time I did an interview, I would come away from it feeling like, oh shit, I fucked up. I said too much. I was too me for that public space. And you know, and you've you've read Octopus, you know, like my my whole thing is like I feel uncomfortable like about how much space I take up, about how loud I am, about how people are going to react to me after I've gone. I feel like I'm like, I, I've, I've said this very openly before, like I make the amount of work I do to apologize for existing, right? Mm -hmm. And and like then I'm putting myself in these situations where I'm constantly doing publicity for children's books and making myself feel like I'm, I'm, I'm a bad person for doing it. And then when I also have like a publisher who's like, you know, telling me which tweets that I should be deleting. Um, and by the way, the tweet that, Okay, this is the best fucking tweet of my life. I will never tweet better than this. When, and my publisher told me in no uncertain terms, I had to remove it. When Harvey Weinstein announced that he was having a documentary put together that would tell his side of the story, I tweeted, apparently Weinstein's having a documentary put together telling his side of the story. I sure hope he doesn't have to fuck himself to get it greenlit. <laughs> it's That's perfect. good though. It's, yeah, it's that is good. <laughs> but apparently, apparently not good if like because oh i don't like what because what parents of kids who buy my book are going to be pro harvey like what the fuck we have uh two geeks talking uh saying too true with a smiley face um from our earlier conversation and throwing a laugh out loud uh about the harvey ones yeah that, that that's good i mean you officially kind of made your break from children's books though right yeah. like you're you're done with that right 
Well, I've, I've got 56 pages left to draw on Black Sand Beach, and I sent off a synopsis for the final, my final Cardboardia book, because they own the rights to the series, so I guess they can do whatever the fuck they want, um, in November of 2021, and they only got back to me with two lines of notes saying, basically, no, we need a wrap-up story in November of 2022. So right now, I'm like, well, I'll send you a fucking synopsis whenever I goddamn feel like it, because the deadline blew <laughs> past while you guys were not responding to me. Mm -hmm. Um yeah I, I, I don't know if you can tell i'm sort of heated about that situation yeah yeah and i like all i want to do is like i've got a lot of books i want to make you know i've got haunted hill is ongoing i've got there's the 12 issues that are out there online already i'm going to be doing a collected volume of that uh probably in may um and i've got uh an, another storyline that i'm in the process of making right now and like it's my favorite book to make because like my rule is i write six pages at a time and then i draw those six pages on like that that and the next day as soon as the wow. two day pages and it's like it's it's perfect because it means that there's no I, i'm never going to walk away from a story and come back feeling like i need to change it or feeling like i'm sick of it or like i've lost interest in the thing that i'm excited about whatever and so it's like very like i'm in total control and then i'm doing a um a new graphic novel called the ex-wives of frankenstein uh which is sort of a, a modern like modern sequel to frankenstein where uh the like the bride of frankenstein and victoria frankenstein are becoming friends awkwardly uh because they found out that their two now very famous husbands have been found locked together in a very gay embrace in the arctic and are returning to uh they're moving to new york city uh and so it's sort i of love just that twist oh my god <laughs> it's, it's gonna be very good like i've <laughs> you know, there's a lot of stuff about like uh body dysmorphia and things with you know when you are literally stitched together from other people but there's also a lot of stuff about like the shitty ways that like frankenstein has been interpreted my favorite thing that i have I'm, I'm spoilers but my favorite thing that so far is they're having brunch and they're talking and victoria just says uh oh please you wouldn't have like you know like everyone thinks he took a long time to make his monster but he had everything done pretty fucking quickly and then mm -hmm. he spent like four months digging up different graves to find a dick he was happy with and so I'm, I, what I want to do is on the Kickstarter, sell the, <laughs> sell the tombstone so that, that you see in that flashback. So the highest level reward will be you can get your name on the tombstone that says you have the best dick in the world. <laughs> Dude, and that's pro people are going to want to, they're going to jump on that. That is an awesome, awesome idea. I love that. We're going to be diving into uh, the Kickstarter for uh, Octopus, a memoir of flailing as well. But I mean, let's, let's dive into this a little bit. So I read... Um, and holy crap, this was such a remarkable experience. This is kind of like an auto like biography almost, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's it's seven it's seven stories set across eighteen months of my life, sort of told out of order to kind of hit the themes the way I want to. Um, but it in a linear sense, it goes from like uh me being in me being in a really terrible relationship while also being married, while also uh being completely miserable through like i tried to kill myself by stealing a boat uh <laughs> after tom taylor ditched me a karaoke um and uh <laughs> long story and um you know then like coming to la for the first time breaking up with a, a a guy i'd been in an online relationship with for like almost a decade who i used to live with uh meeting nice people having weird sex club adventures ending toxic friendships moving here full-time meeting a nice man and like all with the kind of the overriding metaphor based on my longtime fear that I'm in fact turning into an octopus, which has been a, a nightmare that I've had since I was a kid. Gaining an American accent when all your friends used to make fun of your friend for getting a British one. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like, but you know, like you live with a dialect coach for yeah. that long, and he will not let you speak in a New Zealand accent, and then you go back and you're like, oh fuck, I don't even know what I used to sound like. Me meeting uh, surfer dudes uh, who hug a little too much, but don't give it up. Uh, that, I mean, look, if people buy the, the octopus in a bottle, they will get, there's going to be follow-up stories about where each of the men from the book are now or what happened at the end of that relationship. <laughs> and Joe the surfer, holy shit, that one got dark. <laughs> I... Don't even like I, I would not even picture that like just from the interactions that I read I, I could not picture it getting dark, but it sounds like it's gonna be one hell of a twist Let's just say we're on the bus on the way to the zoo one day and he said some really bad shit. And I was like, oh 
can never be near you again and got off the bus. <laughs> so, I mean, can we talk a little bit about the symbolism of the octopus? Like for yeah. you, what does the octopus mean? Um, you know, I think it's, it's, there's a lot of like very obvious kind of joke answers to this. Like I leave ink stains everywhere, obviously. And, you know, I have a lot of tentacles operating a lot of different things, but I think more than anything, it's like the fear of taking up space. Um, in my, in my entire life, like I, I was like the skinniest kid ever. And then I was the fattest teenager ever. And then like up and down, up and down all the time. And I'm always kind of very unaware of how much physical space I take up. Add to that, that this eye is entirely blind. And mm -hmm. so anything sort of passed about, like I can see my hand here and then that's where it disappears for me. So this entire half of my body, I don't know what it's doing. Like I, you know, I can feel it, but like I'm, I bump into people, I like gesture too wildly. Like out. depth perception and stuff on that side, right? And well, no, there, there's literally no vision on this side. And then this side doesn't have depth perception. So ah. like, I'm just, I'm very unaware of how I function mm -hmm. in space. Um, to the point where like, I've been in kind of crowded bars talking and I've just like smacked someone without knowing it. And like, you can, you know, you apologize, but you can't apologize enough for that. And there's no way they're going to react in any positive way, because even if you haven't meant it, they still got hit in the face and they're drinking, they still knock their entire meal off a table. Um, so it's sort of part of that. And then also, the, you know, the oversharing, the being a loud, boisterous person, um, constantly the the and then sort of you know you get into that cycle of you're apologizing for yourself by explaining yourself and then you're telling another story that tries to make the first one better because you realize that someone's looking at you weird because you said a thing about a succatorium and like it just cycles and cycles and cycles and you feel like you're just a big fucking octopus in the middle of the room who shouldn't be there so i also noticed too is like some of your more intimate moments uh we've seen uh the octopus start to kind of show its tentacles as well yeah i mean <sighs> Yeah, okay. Um, there's, I have a, a little bit of a history of, um, I've, I've dated a fair number of people who have said things to me like, you were like, you are the most interesting thing in my life. And that is terrifying to me. I never want to be the most interesting person in the room. I'm always seeking people who are more interesting than me, so I'm not bored. And when someone tells me that, it makes me want to run away, but it also makes me think, if I leave, this person will be bored, which is my worst fear. Um, and so I, I've, I've like become really trapped in situations, or I've had to like break things off with people and know in very certain terms that they are, I mean, I'm not going to say destroyed, like, but like they are ruined, like wrecked by it, ruined, that's the bad mm -hmm. word. They're like wrecked by it for you know, probably not forever, obviously, but like for that short period of any breakup that anyone has, but I don't see them again. So I have to assume that they're like that forever after. And I like, I don't ever want to do that to a person, whether I like them or not. Mm -hmm. um, I, I got a call from the, there's the guy I mentioned in the book who I was in the horribly abusive relationship with uh, for four years, who I moved in with when he got sick and then uh, broke up with. Uh, because of reasons. Um, I got a call from this bookstore down the street from his place saying, hey, can you check in on, insert real name here, um, we're worried about him. I was like, I broke up with him about a year ago. And they're like, we know he comes in here drunk in the mornings asking if we know where you are or if we have a way to contact you. And like, this is a, you know, a, a moderately successful author who has a whole life of his own and has done pretty well for himself in various fields. And now a year after I walked out, he's drunk in the morning, wandering down there, asking, like, just asking a random bookstore if they know where I am because they sell my books. And that holds a lot of guilt, you know? Yeah. It's, it's, I, it's... I, hate I hate this guy. He was an absolute monster. Like, like this is a guy who would like sometimes drug me and chain me up. This is a guy who would like has has physically assaulted me to the point where like I couldn't swallow food for three days, and like I lived off popsicles during that time. It was quite great. Um, I hate him, but I also feel guilty. Um, when I mean, you read in in chapter three that moment where 
insert real name here, gra- as I'm leaving his place, grabs my the arm and says, it's been so hard here without you. That really happened. And I really very cruelly turned and said, yeah, I bet. Um, because I was angry at him for so much. But it felt good to like leave on that note, didn't it? it I mean, and you know, again, Octopus in a Bottle will have the follow-up <laughs> of how we reconnected and then it all went disastrously wrong again because I, I look, I can never st- say no to a bad idea. <laughs> Um, so I mean, it's it's hard just talking about things like this. What was it like mm-hmm. opening those wounds? Like like going in there and redrawing some of these scenarios. That that had to have been like a hard like scenario to like kind of go through. Was it more of like a therapeutic like feeling? Um, there were parts of it that were really that were really fun. Honestly, um, the uh, the. The story about coming to LA and the actually the first story about Indra and I on our night out, the, like those were really fun to do. And even the story about Ray that sort of ends the book um, was really nice because I was like Ray and I were separated by COVID at that point, and mm-hmm. it was just really nice to kind of just spend a lot of time on his face, you know. <laughs> um, and it's like, but at the same time. You know, the, 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 the story is about how I pushed him away for so long because I didn't want to hurt him. Like I, I, I just come out of like my marriage had just ended and I know like it was a bad marriage. We were very unhappy with each other, but I also know that like she was hurting a lot. Um, and I didn't want to see that happen to another person. I just ended things with this other awful guy. I just cut off communication with someone else. I just ended a bad friendship. And I'd seen all these people get hurt by me walking away. And now this man from Canada was like flying to LA to see me because we met at a bird sanctuary in New Zealand. And that's a lot of pressure. And so like, it was so nice to be drawing him and this happy time, these three days we've been together. And Mm -hmm. I felt so guilty because now we were apart and I like, I'm looking back at this three day period where like, I kept pretending like I had to go and do work when I definitely didn't. I was just making sure he didn't get too connected to me. And I could have had those extra three days with him. Now, like, obviously we're reunited now, everything's great and I'm fine with it. But like, yeah, that was hard. That like, those things were hard. The stuff about insert name here, who used to co-write Blastosaurus with me, that was easy. Um, I was, I was angry enough at him still because he'd wasted a lot of my time um, that I, I had fun with that. And I also think, you know, it's one of those things where it was such a funny night um if you're if if you can if you can detach from it it was a really funny night it was Mm -hmm. incredibly awkward and terrible and very sad but by that point i was so detached from that relationship that i couldn't find it anything other than delightful i would love to really i really really love to how you don't put his name in the book not because you don't want people to know who he is but you don't want his name on your book Mm -hmm. that was like chef kiss (laughs) thank you Chef Kiss. Another um, thing I I, uh, I really love to, and I'm going to sound so like dumb, so feel free to correct my terminology, like the uh, the void space on the side of the interiors, mm-hmm, like mm-hmm. how you left that. And uh, like, and, and it, it goes even deeper. I mean, there's one part where you pull a snippet from like uh, how to raise a kid after um, a divorce and there's like the snippet in the page and there's hair on the tape and I loved I looked for those details and I loved that you included a man it, it felt like such a this was such a surreal experience reading this well I can tell you I can tell I can reveal one thing um the hair on the tape was not on purpose <laughs> but I realized it it's like you weren't supposed off. to see that <laughs> it could have it could have lifted some ink off so I didn't want to do it so mm-hmm. I left it in there and I was like fuck it like it felt like it was the perfect it. touch though it like felt so real because like i i have two cats so anytime i'm putting tape on something there's always a hair from either one of my kids or, or one of the cats well i have i have this like <laughs> as like jack donaghy would describe it rich person hair that you really it just like you cannot pull it out but every now and again like it'll just a piece will fall um the the void space around it like all of like all the gutter measurements and stuff was very much um when i drew it i I didn't really have a, you know, like obviously normally when you scan things, you try and remove that stuff, but I was doing everything in this wishy-washy grayscale with these markers and I didn't really know how I could remove it. And when I tried to alter it on the, I scanned the first page and tried to alter it and things and it would just start looking like a shitty photocopy and I didn't want that. And so the whole book is actually photographed instead of scanned. 
Um, so it's it's like essentially uneditable, which is also like really, it was kind of a rule I put in place for myself. Like once this is on paper, it cannot be changed. You are stuck with this. You cannot be scared of this. You cannot go in and, and remove any details later. Is that like, I don't mean to interrupt. I, I don't like to do that, but is that because like you were doing so much, like you're knocking out so many pages a day or is that because you wanted to be committed to this book? Like in I, its I wanted it to be honest. I, I just, I wanted it to be, uh, you know, I mean, look, there's a lot of, I can put up a lot of bluster and I can, it's, it's, it's fun. And it's sometimes it's a wall and sometimes mm -hmm. it's to, I'm either trying to break through a wall or I'm trying to put up a wall. And I, I honestly never know which one I'm doing, but with, um, with this, it was like, there's a lot of stuff in there that I could get scared about putting out into the world that I might want to take back later. And this method meant that I could never take it back. So I think right now, let's 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 put this out in the world, uh, because right now you are at five hundred ninety-five bucks, twenty-one backers. Project we fucking love, Richard. Fuck let's yes. go, man. Let's go. That is so. Congratulations. Let's go ahead and switch over to our campaign showcase and take a look at this Kickstarter. And we are gonna pull it up right here. Everyone watching, we have uh, two geeks talking. Biggest dickus uh, for the tombstone idea. I think that's a good name, Kurt. I think you came up with a good one there. All right, so let's pull this up and let's get I wanna, the... I want to call Kurt out on this. You, like, a reasonable size and well-formed is going to be better than just big, because big could be weird. <laughs> so we are looking at Octopus, a memoir of flailing, the subjectively true story of trying not to turn into an octopus, distracting myself with sex clubs, drinking, and messy relationships. Currently at $595 of $1,496, uh, 21 backers and 31 days left to go. Already a third over goal. Uh, wow, it just jumped up again. Dude, Jesus. congratulations, man. How are you feeling? We just literally went live like 40 minutes ago. I know this is this is kind of insane. Um, it's also that like it's, it's so weird because like because I live in uh, well, because I live here in Canada and I set up the campaign in Canada. Um, it's a weird that's a weird goal to have mm -hmm. <laughs> um yeah because for me it's two thousand canadian dollars so you're seeing different numbers than me so this is this is man this is good <laughs> Oof. uh everyone watching right there is the link um you guys know the drill be sure to check this out with us if you're unable to back it simply putting it on twitter facebook anywhere you can is 100 percent free and getting as many eyes on this project as possible is what we're trying to do so let's go ahead and scroll down and check out uh some more of these covers and interiors uh, so was this like a dog uh, in your life? Because uh, I mean, this is basically, I you know, the words I'm looking for, it's like an autobiography, but one that's drawn, you know, like you drew it. Like the yeah. way the interiors fall out, it's almost like you sat there and wrote it out by hand, um, but you were just drawing it instead. Yeah, I mean, like there is, um, I think there is a typed up script for uh, a couple of the issues, but for the most part, it's like, notes and layouts in a notebook somewhere and the dialogue is kind of is, is mostly from memory you know I, I have an mm -hmm. incredible memory i can basically remember everything anyone's ever said to me and so i like I, I know that these things are are accurate which is probably a little uncomfortable um you know i've removed some names from the book <laughs> the people who come across badly i remove their names mm -hmm. or the people i thought were likely to sue me i remove their names for everyone that's watching, this is what I mean by the interiors. It's like you would almost be looking at these pages in hand um, before you sent these off to like the printer. Like I, I just I love, you know, at the top you have everything written down. Like and um, that, that that sequence. I don't know if it's uh, on the Kickstarter, but the, the the tape. It was just it was it was perfect, man. I was wondering how you did it, and the and you said you took uh, pictures. Like was that different for you to turn taking pictures like into the comic? Well, so I have this. I'm going to get really nerdy. I have this amazing scanner. Um, it's the Epson Workforce 7610. And if you use it on a 32-bit operating system, you can use Epson Scan 1, not Epson Scan 2. And it has a section for photo in there. And mm -hmm. essentially, the scanner takes a picture with a different color of light. So you get this incredible depth um, that is like... But I, I've always thought it was kind of impossible to get. I've never seen anyone else kind of achieve it. Although the uh, Illumon, the the uh, Sean Daly's thing, he seems to get it with watercolor, which very few people manage to do. So that 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 dude's like a master of levels and control from his scans. Um, but what I did is it's so I scanned it as a document and then scanned it as a photograph 
And it's it, like, I want to be really clear. It's not like I'm setting it to look like a photograph. It actually, it's the process of the same light as, as a photograph would do. Okay. And then they're multiplied through each other. So I can get a little bit of crispness in the text um, without losing any of the, of the, um, like the depth and those colors. Cause you know, like when you see anything scanned, you always lose some stuff. Mm -hmm. The hardest part was actually this issue. The first time I scanned it, uh, it, there was like a little bit of moisture on the scanner and every single page had a big shadow in the middle of it. <gasps> and so I had to come back and like, like it, it took like hours of like pressing them flat and like just trying over and over again. And it's such a slow process because I have to use like a, a MacBook Air from 2013 is the, is the newest computer I own that will just will function with this program and i can't use dropbox with it and i it's just a nightmare um so i had to just kind of do trial and error over and over again to make this look right i really love to like right here where this would normally be just a clean line uh mm -hmm. you know you kept the uh the void space so like you see like kind of how you colored outside uh into that too um this is such an awesome experience and i don't think i've really heard of many comics being made in that way like what inspired you to take the picture with the photocopy like that um, it was, it was, it really was just that I was, I wanted to find a way to, to make it uneditable and to make it like, I wanted it to look like the original art. I wanted, you know, like when you look at those, uh, the artist editions that, is it mm -hmm. IDW put those out, I think, um, that are like at the original size and everything. I wanted it to feel like that. And I can actually, I'll grab the book because I got my, I got my proof copy. Um, and like, like in, even printed it really does come through like exactly like it it's, I'm, I'm so happy with how it's all turned out that's so gorgeous and too the tiny moments of color really pop and also like that foil cover oh that's so awesome man i did a little octopus tentacle sketch on the back to make sure that the paper would not bleed with my ink mm -hmm. but yeah so that's like that's that's the you know we're part of the make 100 thing for january so um, what, what is that um it's if you have a reward that is limited to 100 and it, it I think the idea is that like it will bring a lot of new people in who only have a hundred of something or they want to do like a weird art project of like I'm gonna draw a hundred pictures of Wallace Shawn or whatever. They can like sell them in this really limited way. Um, but I thought like I'll do a hundred of that, I can be part of this thing, and it was it was it was the thing that pushed me. I was I wasn't gonna launch until March. Mm -hmm. Um and then I thought like fuck it, January, set the deadline, no going back. <laughs> you you are committed to uh solidifying yourself going forward and i, I love that like uh that, man that is so awesome and this was a really funny interaction too plan B. uh what 82 bucks for a pizza that doesn't fit in the car i i, I just love that interaction <laughs> that really happened <laughs> yeah i mean like all of this was you know it was it was it was a tough night mm -hmm. i wanted it to be good i wanted to try and make things better because like the hardest thing about ending any friendship is like you end a friendship with anger um, and you can hate them for as long as you like afterwards, but there's always going to be that point where you have to grieve for all the good stuff that you've now lost because no friendship is all bad. No bad yeah. relationship is all bad. Um, you know, I have, I have some former friends who have done like truly awful things. I found out stuff about them that is horrifying. And I, I like, I'm like, that's not the person I knew. Um, and I will never speak to those people again. Uh, I've, I'm, I've got a pretty hard line of, of, of stuff that if people do it, they're fucking gone. Um, but that doesn't mean that I'm not really sad for those like fun nights we spent hanging out, drinking and, and like shooting the shit and smoking mm -hmm. cigars until four in the morning. So um, with these interiors, uh, you know, what, what you do everything traditionally, but like, what is some of your style? Like this almost looks like it's like a little bit of watercoloring, like for the trees and like the staircases. It's, uh, it's these, um, oh, it's these here, the dual brush pens, um, that give like a real nice sloppy thing and you can kind of mix them a little bit. They have a mixing pen in them. So it's just like when you're a kid and you have those color change markers. Okay. No, those are cool. <laughs> um, and then I use, um, uh, a F Fudenosuke, uh, hard tip brush pen, which is like dirt cheap, gives mm -hmm. you the best control of line. You can kind of mimic what a, what a brush pen, like a traditional, like Pentel pocket thing would do. Um, but like, it's almost like using a, a, a felt tip pen instead, the way it feels. And it's, it's my favorite and it's, it's incredibly quick. Uh, and they're like dirt cheap. Like I, I think it's like 
on Amazon, you can get a pack of like 15 for like 25 bucks or something. Yeah, that's um, not bad at all. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll go through um, about, I can do about 10 pages with one pen. So I, I will, I will buy, I'll buy a pack every month and, and work my way through them. We have uh, Antoine Nito over on Twitch stopping to say, yay, so excited for this, Richard. Okay, I need to get like the cool kids and get my Keep It and Geekly shirt ASAP. Thank you, Richard. Yeah. <laughs> already doing, already doing the Lord's work. <laughs> I'm your real Lord. <laughs> no, that is so awesome. So let's check out some of these rewards. So uh, we have the digital only, uh, and uh, that's a really cheap price for only $10 Canadian, $8 uh, USD. Um, and then octopus in a bottle for twenty dollars Canadian, uh, fifteen USD. Give us a little bit about what this is. All right, pull me up on the screen. <laughs> Let me show you. <laughs> He's like, I've been prepared for this. <laughs> okay, so for anyone who, for any straight people out there, uh, why are you watching me? No. Um, I, I was at a, I was at a, a Rufus Wainwright concert and Ben Folds was opening, and uh, Ben Folds finished, and a lot of the crowd left because they were there for him. And Rufus Wainwright got up and he goes, all right, now that the straight people are gone, let's have some music. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, uh, so poppers are these little bad boys here. Here's a here's a wrapped up one. Uh, it's a nice little bottle of liquid uh, that you sniff and it gives you a sense of absolute euphoria and insane horniness. Uh, and also relaxes flat muscle tissue in certain areas. If so how many sniffs per bottle, though? Like, how long does that stuff last for? Um, Because, like, I, I would almost imagine, like, sniffing a liquid, like, you could get some use out of that, right? Or do you do you actually, like, snort it up your nose? No, 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 no. You'll, you'll burn the shit out of yourself. I actually got <laughs> to a while I was doing it, and I have a burn in, the, like, in my chest a little bit that kind of sometimes bleeds um, from, like, years ago. <laughs> Uh, a bottle will, if you keep it refrigerated, a bottle can last you two to three weeks before it kind of starts going stale. If you keep that lid real tight, uh, you're kind of, you're, you're better off. Um, and obviously the more times you open it, the faster it'll go off. So if you mm -hmm. have like a big night, you might want to just throw that bottle away in the morning. And the worst part about it is you only know that it's going bad when it gives you a really fucking bad headache from a sniff. Anyway. So obviously poppers feature pretty heavily in the book. They're on the cover of a special edition. There's like enough scenes of me getting some fingers up my ass with a bottle under my nose. Um, don't worry, you never see me naked. You just hear about it happening <laughs> with the person behind me. Um, I, I, <laughs> I said to someone, I said to someone recently that uh, my my butthole is like a renewable resource because it seems to give people energy. Um, and uh, my friend once described me as uh, my butthole has been a camping ground for villains. So Goku yeah. just like. Getting all the energy for the spirit bomb from Richard's butthole. <laughs> <laughs> we have uh, Antoine Nito uh, over on Twitch. Uh, Richard, please don't demonstrate. Uh, and that the word, the reward is the most Richard thing he's ever seen. Uh, how many sniffs per bottle is actually the best response I ever heard from a straight person about what poppers are. <laughs> so, so here's here's what you get. You get this little bottle. There's no poppers in it, obviously. I'm not going to send you something to fuck with. But what I am going to send you is a thing with this beautiful little label, nice collectible bottle, and you open it up, and instead you get this you get a qr code so that you can get uh the extended edition of octopus with an extra story the original four page piece that i did for a, a memoir that i never completed called dick um <laughs> and uh the what else do you get oh and then yeah so like extended stuff essays about all of the people and where they ended up afterwards and then 200 pages of uh back catalog of my other weird comics that aren't on my website mm -hmm. including the horniest fuck blastosaurus story where another co-writer of mine fucks him uh, because he's a Triceratops. Um, <laughs> so if you, if you love Blastosaurus and you want to you wanna see him get railed by a famous voice actor, <laughs> that's the, he said to me, hey, Richard, I'd really like to be in Blastosaurus. I was like, I can make that happen, buddy. I love the fact that you just swapped out top and bottom. It's like perfect. <laughs> So we have the book, um, 144 pages, seven stories, 18 months of his life condensed into turning points. This is an outstanding uh, price for just 23 bucks or $18 USD. You can get the early bird special on this. Um, that you know, I had to jump on that too. Such an outstanding price. Um, and then that foil cover is just as gorgeous. So this is one of only a hundred copies. Yep. And I'll let's see. Number. This is going to be uh, 45 uh, Canadian or 34 USD. So everything signed and numbered as well. And that is a gorgeous purple. Uh, show it up. Put, put that up again. Yeah, here it is. Look yeah, at that. that is gorgeous. I, I was so I was so glad that the proof arrived before the campaign, so I could like make sure. The foil <laughs> yeah. Worked. 
So that is a I, I do I, I'm a sucker for anything purple and that foil is just like perfect We have the sketch cover at 75 uh, Canadian or 57 USD uh, And so this is gonna be just anything you want or are you gonna take uh, a like Anything it's an octopus tentacle holding anything you want and like okay the things I'm gonna say no to are like, if someone get, comes to me and is like, can I see an octopus tentacle holding a swastika? I'm gonna be like, no, you can't, obviously not. But if you come to me and you're like, can I see an octopus tentacle holding a real nice dick? I'm gonna be like, of course, absolutely. I'm very good Hell at drawing yeah. Do you Do you got recommendations? <laughs> <laughs> Please send photos. Please and then that is it for uh, just uh, the rewards that you can you can get. But we do have a whole slew of add-ons. So we have some awesome looking pins. You have the popper, the tentacle holding a wine glass, and the dog as well. So up yep. to three enamel and yeah, enamel pins as well. So really loving those add-ons. And then here is Richard eating a big old hot dog. <laughs> yeah, God, that was a good day. Uh, <laughs> Isn't it sad that I can look at pictures of hot dogs I've eaten and, and remember where I was? I, I loved when you added me on Facebook and it was just you eating a hot dog. I was like, well, I know this is the real deal. I know this is Richard. <laughs> so, man, after uh, checking out this Kickstarter in its entirety, uh, what would you like to say to anyone who might be on the fence about backing? If you just had, you know, uh, an opportunity to uh, talk to him real quick. Like, look, I am... I'm terrified of this. Um, I had planned to go to Kickstarter with the first volume of Haunted Hill. And the whole process of just doing Kickstarter was what was scaring me the most. And so I have this, this motto in life that if you're going to do something, if you're scared to do something, just do something scarier faster. And then you'll kind of, the, the thing you really want to do will be easy by comparison. This book is like the most personal thing I've ever done. Obviously it's a memoir. It kind of has to be, but like I am pouring myself onto the page. When I said that people told me never to publish it, that was after the first three issues that they saw mm -hmm. and i'd made the decision not to ever show it to anyone and so there is there is there is no filter on the other four chapters you know it, it becomes even rawer than it was um last year my one of my best friends in the world uh jim craft who i co-written a children's book with um he was like a real like i i describe him as an unapologetic dirtbag and the kindest man i've ever known and I just love that about a children's author. Like you're like he's he's a dirt bag. He writes books for kids though. He's you know they're all right, but like like <laughs> we we met, we met on on the on the Java chat on SilverDaddies.com, and like I did a lot of weird shit on webcams with him, um, and then we became friends because like some shit happened where his like he got in a fight with some people in his family and was real sad on Thanksgiving, and so we had a instead of like. Instead of me shoving ice cubes up my ass on a on a on a webcam, I sat and had turkey with him for. Five okay, hours. I thought you were gonna. I thought that was gonna go in a different direction with the turkey. I was I was like trying to <laughs> mentally prepare myself for. It. I was like, this is about as dark as Keeping It Geekly has ever gotten. <laughs> um, no, no. <laughs> no but what? I never. No, I don't waste food. Um, <laughs> Just ice cubes. <laughs> yeah, you can make more of those. <laughs> Um, anyway, so, you know, he, like, he was, he was, like, a dirty man, like, he was a real, but he was, he was so proud of it. Mm -hmm. Um, no, well, like, he wasn't showing off about it, he just never filtered anything, you know, am I, I'm actually really good friends with his grandson now, and, uh, he would always say, like, like, Jim would always say to me, oh, don't tell my grandson this story, and I, and I was like, but you have told him that story at Christmas dinner, like, this is the man who wants, he was, at Christmas dinner with the family with and his ex-wife was there and she was being like surly towards him and he just said oh she's just angry because I gave her herpes but who knows where herpes come from he was a the smartest man I know and the filthiest man I know and I fucking loved him so much um and he'd lived this amazing life where he'd been like friends with Andy Warhol and was like head of acquisitions for an art museum and traveled all over the world having these adventures and then ended up in a small town in upstate New York living in a haunted post office and we became friends and I went and stayed with him several times. And anyway, uh, he he died last year. And uh, he, right before he died, he told me that he felt like he'd never achieved the things he wanted to achieve. And he'd never, he'd, he'd put too many things in the way. And I was like, you've never put anything in the way. You've always done and said exactly what you are. He's like, no, I've always been myself. I just never pushed to get myself ahead. And I was like, I don't want to feel that way. So 
uh, I'm, I put out Octopus. And I started a newsletter where every week I tell a true story from my life that I've been told not to tell. Uh, and I'm this, you know, this isn't, I'm not, I'm not bragging about going to sex clubs on senior discount day. I'm not bragging about <laughs> meeting a wizard behind a dumpster. Like I, I'm, I just, I'm like I said, I make work to apologize for existing and I, keep making things in the hope that like it's, it's a it's a it's a tentacle that i'm throwing out into the world that if someone sees it and they like it if someone feels understood by it you know i read a lot of things i read a lot growing up and i rarely ever read anything that made me feel like the author would understand me and i want you know there's there's seven billion of us there's got to be other weirdos like me um and even if they're even if you're not as gross as me, as weird as me, as whatever as me, uh, I, you're as human as me, and I think that you will enjoy this book. And also, that is beautiful, dude. It's, it's my 270 something book at this point. I'm probably pretty good at making them. That was such a beautiful, and this is 271 uh, interviews. So what a good number. Oh, nice. What, what a good number uh that this is what i love about richard so much we went you know i asked him why should we should shoot back the book we ventured into him sharing stories about him shoving ice cubes up his butt on webcam uh and then it was such a roller coaster of emotions like that that ending part i was like this is beautiful you should be like up at a podium saying this to audiences like <laughs> like in high schools just leave out that first part like <laughs> yeah this, this is the problem this is why i can't like i, I have to, i like i don't i don't I don't ever want to horrify anyone. I don't ever want to shock anyone. I don't ever want to like corrupt <clears> anyone. <throat> I just also want people to know that if they are whatever they are, especially mm -hmm. like, look, there is a real move in like, um, in queer culture to make things family friendly, acceptable. You know, like we, we want to, we all have this need to like remain hidden, like, like, terrible things are happening in the world right now people's rights are being stripped away from them like i was gonna say especially in the queer community but a lot of it in the queer community there's other obviously other people are having terrible times but there is you know within my community there is a lot of people who want to shelter themselves and say we want the picket fence we want the marriage we want the kids we want the the life we want to be we, we want to buy into that and that's fine like no tea no shade do your thing um, or we want to be the family friendly gays who can go to a parade that's sponsored by an airline or a bank. And that doesn't make me feel comfortable. I do not want to buy into rainbow capitalism or buying gray Skittles because colors don't matter. I want to be like, look, this, this, the pride parade was a protest march. The thing that differentiates gay people from straight people to really simplify it there, sorry, but like, what the you know historically when people were discussing gay the thing the only difference was the sex the thing that we were demonized for was the sex like there are a lot of straight men out there who have never had anything up their butthole and they're missing out on some very fun sex because they're terrified it'll make them gay and it all comes from misogyny because like being gay gets associated with being feminine because you're getting fucked like it's it's absolute bullshit and it, it makes me very angry um and I think it's it's right to be angry about it. It's right, and it's right yeah. to be like, look, if we're going to talk about this, we're going to talk about it on the terms that that on the terms of the things we were oppressed for, not on the terms of how we want to fit into society. See, and this is exactly what I fucking mean. Now we're talking about rights and everything. Like this has been just such a roller coaster. Uh, two geeks talking. Welcome to Richard's TED Talk. Absolutely, and I think you're 100 percent right with that. Um, everyone watching, once again. Right here is the link. Be sure to check it out. Richard, you're killing it right now, man. I'm um, just taking a look at your campaign. We are right now at 800, $837 fucking dollars, 28 backers, man. Dude, over the halfway mark. Congratulations. I think let's end this podcast on a strong note. And, uh, I, you know, I got to ask. I got to ask you a question uh, that is tailored to you individually like uh -huh. what is your secret to not just like melting like how are you able to pump out the amount of work that you do and not burn out or if you do like what do you do to recover from it um i kind of so i have to have like a very uh a regularly changing schedule um i'm energized by creativity and other people i'm energized by ideas more than anything 
Um, no matter how tired I am, if someone says, do you want to write a story right now? I like, I know that that'll wake me right up. Um, in terms of like the actual physicality of it, I try and sleep in three hour increments because if you do uh, 90 minute or multiples of 90 minutes, then you're kind of in a, the easiest space to wake up from. So you never have that Ooh, feeling, right? Um, so I'll usually do two, three hour naps a day um, in, in each 24 hour period. Uh, or when I'm, when I'm like, with my husband, which is about half the time, and we're actually sharing a bed, I will try and do either an hour and a half when he goes to bed, get up and work through the night, an hour and a half before he gets up, um, and then a three hour nap in the day. So it's like a lot of like little <laughs> things around pulling on ropes. I have a different alarm set that all sound like school bells that I change regularly, but so I can move from project to project. I have multiple, I have multiple offices in my house, and then I have, I have three offices in my house, and then I have uh, here in LA, I have two. And so and within the, the office, I have different desks. I've, you know, I've got a desk behind me over there. I've got two desks to the side here. And each one will always have a different project fully set up, ready to go. So that when I need to change, when that alarm goes off, I switch to the next subject as if I'm in high school and just move on to the next book for another hour. So it's like, it's, it's always about tricking my brain. Um, and then on top of that, like I do have a, I have a condition. <laughs> So yes, so no, not everyone can do this. I'm very sorry. Uh, the reason my eyes all jacked up, and I, I think I talked about this last time, is uh, my brain doesn't go into regular sleep patterns. I release all of my chemicals at the same time rather than in cycles. Giggity. Um, and so I'm <laughs> always in fight or flight mode, essentially. So when I do sleep, it's a very light sleep, and then I'm just back to it. So it's physical rest, no mental rest, and... Yeah, I need like five and a half hours and you're like, I was trying to do that because that, that's a thing. Like, I, I forgot what it's called, but sleeping in increments like that is a thing you can oh, tell your body to do. Oh, are you talking about sleep? Where yes. you do like 20 minutes? Well, no, no, it's like it's like you sleep a couple hours here and then you wait, you, you're up for like six hours and you sleep another three and then you're up for six hours. And you, it's a very strict schedule you have to stay yeah. on. But yeah, there's, there's different, sorry to, sorry to cut you off, there's different versions, but there's one where I really like, I did it for about a month, where you only sleep in 20 minute increments and you do it with your feet raised so you get more blood to your head. And if you can get a sleep apnea mask, if you don't have sleep apnea, get get one of these machines, get a sleep apnea machine, they're amazing. Floods you with oxygen while you're sleeping so you feel like you've had a lot more rest. I would probably end up punching everyone I've seen if I only slept for 20 minutes at a time. Like, I, I need to hit that deep REM sleep for whatever reason. Oh, man. Now, here's, I, here's, I, one thing, here's one thing I will say. If you if you share an office with someone and they sometimes sleep there and they have their CPAP machine there and then you're like, I've never tried one of those. And so then you start using it and then they move away and then you message them to be like, I really miss your CPAP machine. And then they get mad at you because they're like, that goes right in your fucking nose. I was like, yeah. You, you've had me. You, you've had me in your nose before. Deal with it. <laughs> <laughs> it's like using so much toothbrush, Richard. <laughs> no, that is Nothing awesome. Like, a, like you're not tasting it. Fair point. Fair point. Yeah. Everyone watching, man, this has been such an awesome chat. We're ending on eight hundred. You never gone upside down like Spider Man, kiss but nose to nose and just breathe back, and <laughs> sneeze back and forth with someone. I have done some interesting things, but I think we'll have to save that for the chat after the podcast. With that being said, guys, it is time for us to wrap up. It has been a lovely Tuesday afternoon. Right here is the link. Be sure to back this awesome book today and get on those early bird specials while you can. Richard, thank you for swinging by. It's always an awesome thank time you. hanging out with you. Everyone else watching, I hope you have a fantastic day. But most importantly, guys, keep it geekly.